We want to welcome you this morning. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord today. I, I've got something to uh, to kind of pat ourselves on the back a little bit, I guess. I was at a, uh, a minister's meeting this week, and one of the main reasons I went to this minister's meeting is I couldn't wait to hear all the stories about churches opening up and how uh, they were doing it and the, the, uh, the precautions that they were taking and, and all the things. And so there was probably, I don't know, maybe... 20 pastors at this meeting and at one point one of them says so so how many churches are opening up yet and nobody raised their hand and then i said well we're, we're opening this sunday and all of a sudden i became the expert in the room what are you doing i I've, I've probably got all 20 of those guys calling me tomorrow to figure out how today looked and i'm like i have no idea I can tell you we spaced our chairs out. I can tell you the kids are going to be in with us. Uh, I can tell you that I have no idea if five or 500 people are going to show up, none whatsoever. Um, the other, other churches in the country that have opened up already, usually the, uh, uh, the going uh, average of people that are comfortable with coming back, they say it's around 40 to 50%. We're doing pretty good today, actually. <laughs> Listen, uh, yeah, and I, I, I commend you for being here. But I really don't care about numbers. Sincerely. That's one of the things that God has shifted in me during the season. Is all I want is the power of God in this house. I don't care if there's only five of us. We've got the power of God. That's a checkbook win in my notebook. That's what we must, what we are. We're a people defined by the presence of God. But I love that we come together. And I love that you feel safe enough to be here. I love that we've got kids all over the place. My mind are over the corner there. Uh, it, it's a, I, I know I need to be a bit more entertaining today to hold everybody's focus. I was thinking about next week doing puppets up here. Did you guys listen to me if I broke out Elmo or something like that? Um, we, we just, I mean, we're always saying this in Mountain View. We're a family church, and I'm so happy to be a family church. Uh, I, I want everybody to feel welcome here. And uh, we will resume children's ministry in time. I'm not exactly sure just when. Like I said, on one of our updates, we're going to readdress that uh, at the beginning of June. But for the rest of this month, at least, we're, we're going to be uh, having children's ministry streamed by our esteemed and highly capable Pastor Rachel. Uh, and there are a lot of families that are home watching her, uh, even right now. Um, but if you're comfortable to come here, come here. And if you're not, we, we want to we reach out. One of the things that's going to be a little bit different here before I get into the preaching of the word is... We are going to become a church that streams very well. Because right now, if you'll notice, I'm, I'm looking into an iPad for the many people that are watching at home, and that's just about as low-rung ghetto as you can get. <laughs> we should have been so much more prepared for this season. Uh, yeah, listen, I, I, I know that, uh, I, I know what we usually run here, and I just got done saying that we're not real focused on numbers, but I want to give you a praise report. Um, the number of people that are watching our services online are no exaggeration. In some instances, about five times as many as come to this church. So that's a win for me too. Listen, it's important that we do community together. And everybody who's here today loves being here and being with one another. Uh, but the world is ingesting messages of faith differently than your daddy's generation did. And I say, cool, that's fine. Listen, if I got 150 people showing up here and 350 watching from at home, I'm, we're still talking to 500 people. Is that 500? Okay, good. <laughs> My accountant mother, is that 500? <laughs> so we're, we're going to kind of throw some effort at that, so we're getting some equipment at that. We want to be able to stream our, our worship experience, so you're going to be seeing that. We, we, we are never going to stop streaming Sunday mornings at Mount Peak Christian Assembly. It's just going to look better and better from here on in. Uh, like I said already, we're, we've got to go in, for the time being, going away with the meet and greet time. But I want you guys to love on one another. I want you guys to, to, to just cultivate that family feel that we're going for at Mountain View. Well, we joked around this week about possibly uh, putting on name tags and asking people to write on there your preferences. Like if you're a hugger, right hugger? You know, if you're a handshake, right a fist bumper, the elbow bumper, or the probably highly esteemed, don't you dare come within my six foot bubble. You know? So we thought that might be a little bit polarizing right now. And listen, and I'm, I'm serious about this. It is so important that everybody who is here feels safe to be here. Okay? So we want to respect. Don't, don't go hugging on people that don't want to be hugged. Okay, well, let's just do this. Huggers in the room, identify yourself. Those are the only people you're allowed to hug. Okay, look around right now. 
and guys would be checking out the hottie next to you, be like, how close can I get to her? Knock it off, okay? But the, no, listen, it's okay, but I want people to respect other people's boundaries, it's to respect where they're at and how they feel about this. Uh, we want this to be a safe place for everyone. Um, giving. Can I just say, I'm so proud of you guys. I am sincerely so proud of you guys. Uh, one of the panic situations, not, not our church, thank God, but a lot of other churches, uh, we haven't met for months now. And one of uh, uh, heard a number of stories of, of pastors like, oh no, we're going to have to shutter our doors. Like, I can't pay the mortgage. I can't keep the electric bills on if we're not meeting. Uh, I believe that God has been faithful across the board. I've heard many, many stories that are awesome testimonies when it comes to being able to still do the work of the Lord. Well, most of you give online, and that's awesome. Uh, I want to encourage you. Listen to me. We, we are in a financial situation at Mount View Christian Assembly that the way our previous leadership has set us up is for success. And we're good. We're very good. But don't rob yourself of the blessing of giving to the Lord and the Lord's work even during a pandemic. Okay? I will always give you an opportunity to be blessed by God because God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. I want to give God every opportunity he has to love me. Amen. And everything that I have comes from him anyway. I'm not going to rob him just because... My finances get a little bit tighter? No, I'm going to show him honor, show him glory, and the vast majority of you are, and I'm so proud of you. God has been faithful, you're being faithful, but we are no longer, for the time being, going to be passing offering bags around, okay? When you leave today, there will be ushers in the back with offering bags. If you feel compelled to give, the Holy Spirit is telling you to give, do that on your way out, or we will, for the time being, no longer be passing the bag around. And some people look at that and say, that's just a a petri dish of Corona, so you don't want to grab that from somebody next to you, okay? Um, it, it's funny that the more people I talk to about this season, the more people I talk to about church, the more people I talk to uh, about what's expected and how the future may or may not look, the more people I hear say something like this, I don't really want to go back to normal. Isn't that funny? Now listen, you hear me really well. I'm not talking about the voices of fear that are absolutely running rampant with your emotions right now. I'm not talking about that. That garbage needs to go away. That is not from God. God has not given us a spirit of fear and anxiety, but culture sure is trying to. That needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. I hear what many people are saying. I, they don't want church to go back to normal. And what I think people mean by that is, is this. Um, well, collectively, it's personally and individually from Mount You've heard me talk about health forever. For months now, I've been talking about, you know, we need to get healthy, healthy, healthy. There's some specific things that, that I believe God is addressing in this, and, and he's, he's doing tremendous works. So we've just laid ourselves before him and said, God, we want to be a healthy Organism in the kingdom of God, and in some areas, maybe Mount View hasn't been. Help us address these things. We're listening, and He is. But what I'm talking about, not getting back to normal, is kind of like the church as a whole. Because just like the children of Israel that we read about through the generations upon generations upon generations in the Word, comfort does bad things to churches. Comfort does bad things to Christians. Comfort has really, if I can be abrupt, screwed up American Christians. When we talk about not getting back to normal, you want to know what we're talking about? We, we don't want to be whiny Christians anymore. We don't want to be entitled Christians, self-focused Christians, impatient Christians. Christians, and because we often become those things in times of peace and comfort, powerless Christians. When I'm talking to people about things they want to see end, I'm hearing more and more and more and more, not just from leaders, not just from pastors, not just from spiritual influencers, from believers saying, Dear God, let us not go back to what we've been. 
To which I say, yes, 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 and amen. I don't want to go back to normal. I want God to continue to recalibrate his church, especially in America, if I can say that. I want God to continue to redefine the simple foundational things that we have gotten away from. That's what I mean when I say we cannot waste this season. We have to address what it is God is doing in his church through this. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, have your way, Jesus. You are in control and you are in this process, no matter what this process looks like. God, you, like we sang about earlier, you, you trade what looks like ashes, devastation, desolation in our lives for beauty and for glory. And so God, in this season of ash, we're looking for beauty. In this season of anxiety, we're looking for peace. In this season of concern and fear, we're looking for new, solid, foundational peace. Have your way, Jesus. Say what you want to say. Make us into what you want to make us into, no matter how it looks, God. Well, we no longer just rely on our own agendas, on our own process. We want yours. Yes. In your holy name, amen. So I, I've titled this sermon, What Just Happened? <laughs> What, what, what just happened? And the more I thought about it, though, the more I thought a more appropriate title would be, what's still happening? What's, what's going on? This, uh, this whole thing that we're in the middle of right now, it seems like more the middle than, yeah, I don't know, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no prophet, I'm not saying I, I know what's going to happen in the next weeks, coming months, I have my opinions about things, but this thing that we're walking through is not over by any stretch of the imagination. We're, we're in the middle of it, and that's okay. I, I, I don't want to talk about this thing as though it's behind us, but there have been some things behind us that have done incredible things. I still remember the first Sunday that we canceled around here. Uh, it was not, well, this is the 10th Sunday since we've, we've been together. It was uh, Friday, March 13th. Friday the 13th. Oh, well. Um, Friday the 13th in March, and I was so, you guys may remember the, the update that I put out on our website and on Facebook, I was like, we were so determined to have church and to just keep going, and now we're being told by our government officials, our district officials, and the Assemblies of God, it's the best idea to just, you know, step back and see where this thing goes, and maybe we'll see you guys in, in two weeks. I had no idea that I wouldn't stand before many of you for ten Sundays. I had no idea that we were going to walk through what we've been walking through. And I had no idea that God was going to do what he's in the process of doing. Had I known those things, that this is why it's not really good for us to know the future. Had I known those things, oh, I would have been really nervous on that Friday the 13th of March. But now, in hindsight, on the flip side of the 10 weeks, the 10 Sundays, that have gone by since then, I'm so excited about what God is doing. I'm so excited about the things that he's making his church and his people into. Uh, but there are a lot of really weird voices out there, right? There's a lot of voices of fear going on. There's a lot of voices, of, there are a lot of voices that say, well, normal is never gonna happen again. That we're, we're never, 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 never going to go back to what things look like. There, there's, there's a lot of voices that are, are already cautioning us about the second wave of the coronavirus. Can you imagine that? Like, I mean, we're not sure the first wave ever hit, but we're talking about the second wave and how we still need to shelter in place and stay in our homes. And I've got my opinions about that. You can disagree with me, but I'm right. Um, <laughs> there are, are states and counties and, and, and uh, cities that are talking, they're saying scary words like indefinite. Okay, you're going to hate me for saying this. Some of you may love me for saying this. Some of you are going to hate me for saying this. But it's really interesting that a lot of those places are the, are the blue states. Yeah. This whole thing is not a, a political issue. Yeah. Listen, a, a worldwide health crisis should be nonpartisan, should it not? Yeah. I don't know, that's just my rant. That's not in my notes, but hey, that's for free. Um, 
There, there are churches in California right now that they're literally being told, we have no end in sight for when you're going to start meeting again. I've got buddies that are pastors in states like that. And, and, and uh, actually in California, pray for our brothers and sisters out there. There's a growing movement of pastors that are saying, hey, with, with or without government approval, we're going to start meeting the last Sunday in May, which interestingly enough is Pentecost Sunday. So I kind of love the optics of that, you know, but uh, pray for them. I, I, we stand in support of you. California, we stand in support of that. Easy to say because we don't have the Gestapo knocking on our door for being here today. So pray for them. Uh, one of the quotes from a, a uh, rather large church out there, the pastor said, when they were, they were talking about their intent to meet at the end of this month, he said, we're not here to rebel. We're not here as activists. We just want to be deemed as essential and open up. That makes sense to me. Because I went to Lowe's yesterday. And there were probably 10 times as many people at Lowe's that there are here. And that's been legal this entire time. Just saying, I'm saying a lot of things that are on my notes right now. Uh, another, <laughs> thank you, I will. Uh, another um, uh, pastor of a, a, another large church out in California said this, and I love this. He said, we do not partner with fear, but we choose to lean into faith and hope as well as practicing wisdom and safety. And that's what we're wrestling with here. We're wrestling with wisdom and safety while pushing back against fear, panic, and anxiety. And that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing. Because wisdom, uh, well actually there's only real one capital W of wisdom, that's God's wisdom. But man's wisdom is very subjective. It's all over the map. Because here's the deal, right now, watching from the comfort of their home, there are people, brothers and sisters, whom I love, that think you're crazy for being here right now. That's their wisdom. <laughs> I'm going to be cheering about that. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're nuts. <laughs> um, and then there are people here that are mad at me for not opening up nine weeks ago. Okay, so wisdom is something we have to be really reliant on the Holy Spirit to speak because my wisdom is going to look different than your wisdom. But it's, it's so important that Christians practice wisdom and safety and push against fear. An article I read very recently, the, the Arthur's article said, uh, Christians must, in the middle of all this, Christians must example sympathy and sanity. And I'm going to add a third S to that. Spirit. Sympathy, sanity, and spirit. We need the voice of the Spirit today. We need the voice of prophecy today. The world is listening. You know that the Google search for how to pray went viral in the last few weeks? Never before has that happened. In the last few weeks, you got people logging on saying, so how do I connect with this God guy? They're listening. They're listening, Christians. They're listening. Maybe like never before. So we must example sympathy, sanity, and spirit. God, give us that voice. And it's, it's in that respect that I, I say the next few comments here because I'm going to ruffle some feathers. Um, the coronavirus is real. It is. People have died. And that's tragic. I'm not going to stand up here and put on my tinfoil hat like I drove around a few Sundays ago and talk about these weird conspiracy theories, which may or may not be true. I really don't know. But there's no denying that the people that have suffered and died are real. And we must be sympathetic. We must wrap our arms around places that have been hit harder than we have. And we must love at all times. In all circumstances, there are people that are saying, don't turn your back on us. I lost my grandma. There are people at home right now that are saying, I'm too afraid to come out in public. Don't turn your back on us. Be sympathetic. So in your exampling of whatever your sanity is, which I'll say some of you have a really loose definition and grasp of sanity. <laughs> Be sympathetic. Be sympathetic. Example the Holy Spirit. Speak only what He tells you to speak like Jesus did. Don't say what He says not to say. That's just a good practice. Okay? 
Um, but I will say this much. Our response to this has been horrifically in error. Now, I'm not just talking about society. I'm not just talking about certainly political parties or, or ideologies or worldviews. I'm talking about us. Our response to this has been, and I would say this, mostly fear-based. That's why you've heard me preach to you, those of you who've watched me online, most of the sermons I preached for those nine Sundays had to do with what? Fear not. The most often repeated command in the Word of God is don't fear. And brother, sister, we've failed. Can I, can I be honest with you about that? Um, I failed. I failed. So what just happened? Let me tell you a little bit about what happened to your pastor in this season. Um, I've really, from the very beginning, hated not being able to meet with you. Hated every second of it. I, I, I just love being with my, my church family. and I, I love standing up here and talking about just the wonders, the beauty of our Lord and, and, and being able to worship Him together. I mean, it's just... It became very apparent to me, something that I've known for a very long time. That's just a part of who I am. Without it, I feel like half there. So from the very beginning, I hated not being able to be with you. Um, but it got really bad for a few days. I got really discouraged. And I said this online a few weeks ago. It was right around the time that the Governor Herbert released his four-phase recovery process. And in it, he said churches and houses of worship won't be able to expect to meet for until the end of phase four, which was supposed to begin in the fall. And man, that, that just hit me heavily. Heavily. I, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what, what are we going to do? I, if I, I can't be together with these people. If I can't pastor these people for months and months and months, what are we going to do? And I got dark. I got dark. Your fear not pastor, fear bad. There, there was a two-day period there where I, I didn't answer my phone. I had people like Dan Campbell, where's Dan? He was, okay. Uh, people like Dan Campbell reaching out to him, and I, I didn't answer the phone because I was just wallowing. Hey, buddy, good to see you. Um, my parents were so concerned about me, actually, because I was the phone, they drove to my house, I was like, dude, what's up? And I'm like, I don't know if we're going to make it through this. <laughs> my dad pastored this church for 30 years, and I'm going to kill it in the first year. <laughs> Fear not! Pastor Ken rails and screams and then lays at home not talking to my wife because I'm so petrified. We, we failed. I don't know, maybe some of you have stories that look like that. Um, my cycle went like this, and just to you know, preface this, I've said this to you before, some of you know this about me very well. Uh, being angry, uh, or not being angry, rather, rather, being afraid makes me angry. It just does. It, it pisses me off when I'm afraid. So imagine my cycle in this. I, I, I'd be afraid and get angry. Be afraid and get angry, and I'm afraid. Be afraid and then get angry. So for those two, three days there, I was really not doing well. You know, what, what shook me out of it was that Sunday coming up here, and even though nobody was out there proclaiming to the iPad faith and truth, like preaching the word, proclaiming the word, speaking the word over yourself does something. Can I just say that? So people sitting at home wrestling with this. Listen, there's not a person on God's green earth who has all their mental faculties that has not struggled with fear and anxiety. Speaking the word and speaking truth changes things. Like, I mean, I, I, was, I was like, I, I was praying down here that Sunday morning and Dale Whittle came up to me. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, not really, man. Not really, I'm struggling. And then I got up behind this pulpit, and I looked at that little camera, and I spoke truth, and something shifted. Something clicked. And guess what? It's not just Bible college graduates that get to do that. It's you. You guys. Speak the truth over yourself, because you're bombarded every minute of every day by these devices that we carry in our back pockets, and the voices of fear and anxiety when we should be bombarded with this. Speak the truth. Speak the truth over yourself. It works 
wonders. So what happened to me through that process? What, what just happened to your pastor? Uh, one of the verses that God jumped off the pages at me with, that this is, it's a Christian cliche verse, you're all going to know it, you're going to recognize it when I start reading it, but man, I got to read it with fresh eyes coming out of this petrified wussy boy state that I was in for a few days. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. You've got a race marked out for you. Before you were born, God looked at the trajectory of your life. The places you'll go, oh, to quote Dr. Seuss. Oh, the places you'll go was God's idea. He marked out for you your destination and your trajectory. Fix your eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus who points at that destiny and says, guess what? You weren't born at the wrong time. You weren't born in the wrong place. You weren't born to the wrong people. And God knew COVID was coming. God knew everything that he has allowed in your life was coming. Fix your eyes, church. Not on fear and anxiety and worry and concern. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit of something about the, the, uh, the season that I believe that we're in. Um, this verse has always meant something really profound to me. And it goes back to, yes, thank you, Olivia. It goes back to, hey, uh, I love that there are kids in here. I say that. I sincerely do. Like, I want you, kids, if you have something to say, go ahead and talk with me. You can say it. All right, I know Pastor Rachel gives you a moment to interact. Pastor Ken will, too. Okay? Like I said, puppets next Sunday, so it'll be fun. Uh, when I was in Bible college, I had these. Anybody ever have prophetic dreams that you know are from God? Everybody ever have prophetic dreams that you're positive or from God, but you don't really know what they mean? Yeah, I, I've had some that are just immediately apparent what God is saying, and some that very quickly become apparent what God is saying. And then I've got a few that I still have no idea what in the world God is saying. This is one of them. I was in Bible college, and it was a really, really profoundly deep, uh, powerful spiritual environment that I was in. And I was just chasing after Jesus and loving every minute of it. And one night, God gave me this dream that I was in this uh, larger church. It was packed full of people, and they had this special speaker. She was this little, like, elderly Asian woman. And in the dream, I have no idea what she was saying, and none whatsoever. But I remember the power and the presence of God being so thick in this place. And in my dream, at the end of the service, she gives an altar call, and I remember going forward. I have no idea what the altar call was for. I, mean, I don't remember anything that was logically happening in the dream, but I go forward, and I'm standing up there waiting there just worshiping, and, and she's going around praying for people, and I notice at the time that she's not walking, she's like floating two inches off the ground. Weird, right? Yeah, weird. Um, didn't weird me out in the dream, though. It was just something that kind of pointed to the power of God. Something really important is going on here. Something special is going on here. And she came to me, and she put her hand on my forehead. And the next thing, I don't remember like falling down, but the next thing I remember was looking up. And the entire roof of this huge sanctuary was gone. And there was a spiraling cathedral of seats going on into infinity with countless faces looking down at us. And I knew what they were thinking in that moment. What they were thinking is, what are they going to do? Watch Watch what happens next. What are they going to do? It's an important period. There's something happening here that's profound and meaningful and deep and spiritual. And that was 23 years ago. I have no idea the deeper meaning behind that. But here's what I think. Here's what I believe. I think we're getting close to that. What are they going to do? That we have a great cloud of witnesses. The saints that have gone before us. 
that know the end from the beginning because they're with the Lord. The angelic hosts that know what is going to happen at certain points in humanity are looking at us and saying, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? I've wondered about the, the marriage supper of the Lamb where we all get together on the flip side of everything and, and we celebrate what God has done. We celebrate that He's brought all things into fulfillment and made all things new. And I wonder, I just wonder, what generation it's going to be that the Apostle Paul and Peter and the disciples and these, these heroes of the faith and these grand biblical characters are going to look at and say, no, 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 you know my story. You've read my story. I want to hear yours. What was it like to live in the days that you lived? What was it like to experience the things that you experienced? What was it like? There's a great cloud of witnesses watching us now. And I believe we're getting close to that stage, close to that period in human existence where they're starting to really pay attention and they're starting to say, what are they going to do? How are they going to handle this? How are they going to walk into this next season that God is allowing? What we do next, brothers and sisters, is crucial. What you do next in this season is crucial. God has allowed all of this, is allowing all of this for a purpose that is more meaningful than we can imagine. That is more defining than we can imagine. And I'm tired of believers in particular looking at these sets of circumstances and panicking. Huh. Because God's in control. First and foremost, God's in control. Secondly, and again, I'm going to say something that's going to be getting me in trouble. I actually don't believe there's really anything to be afraid about. Amen. I sincerely don't. We can no longer do business as usual. <laughs> we just can't. We've got to be done with it. We've got to be done with this Sunday-only Christianity, which is not Christianity at all. It's country club religion, and God's sick of it. We need to be sick of it, too. We can no longer do business as usual. The message of the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ is too important to be wasted the way we've been wasting it. That's right. Some of you believe it. Others of you will. Fix your eyes, the Bible says. The, the, the Greek word there is aparao. Aparao. And it, it, the, the literal meaning... Uh, fix your eyes, it, it, it means to turn your eyes away from something and to focus on something else. To which I say yes and amen. Listen, some of the things that I tend, I don't know about you, it's probably just me, I'm sure you're further advanced than this. But some of the things that I tend to focus on are downright silly. Downright stupid to waste my life worrying about. I need to fix my eyes on a minutely basis I need to follow the instruction of that verse. But I, I love that the NIV translate that, translate that aparao into fix. Because there's, there's another definition of fix that, that reads like this. To repair back to the originally intended working order. You need your eyes fixed. You need your eyes to start focusing in on things that they were always supposed to focus in on instead of the silliness, the waste of time, the absolute misery of doldrum that you look at. We need our eyes fixed. So what just happened? God started fixing our eyes. God started fixing our eyes. God started fixing our eyes. And it's time that we recognize and admit that we've needed our eyes fixed for a long time. The church needs her eyes fixed. Pastor Ken needs his eyes fixed. And that's what God has started. What just happened? What is happening? What is going on? Oh, I'm starting to see right. I'm starting to see better. I'm starting to focus better. 
<laughs> and so is the church as a whole. And for that, I rejoice. <clears throat> so some of the things that he's allowed me to focus in on. Uh, we spent all of last year going to, going over MDCA DNA, the distinctives of what makes us us. And all of those things are set in stone and they're the, the parameters that we operate by. But he's kind of honed me in on function in the middle of all of those things. We want to know what our function is. You want to know what your pastor says our function moving forward is? Yeah? Okay, five of you. The rest of you take notes and read it later. Come forward to you. Here we go. Focus. Fix our eyes. Simplify. Bring my vision back to original intended working order. You ready for it? Revival. Discipleship and evangelism. You hear me at home? You want to know what Mountain View is about? Revival, discipleship, and evangelism. This is what we need to get real. We need to get functional. We need to get healthy. And we need revival. We need discipleship. And we need evangelism. When was the last time you witnessed? When was the last time I witnessed? We may edit this out of the video, but it's been a long time for me. Because, oh, I do that from the pulpit. I do it every Sunday, God. But does the barista at Starbucks know that I'm a Christ follower and believer? Probably not. Is there anything different about the way that I talk? How about discipleship? There's always other levels that God wants to take us to. Do you recognize that? How long has it been since you went up a level? How long has it been since you went up a level? Let's get real. Let's get focused. Let's fix our eyes. Are you growing? Are, are you better than you were last year? Are you better than when you were five years ago? Are you closer to the Lord? Do you hear his voice more? Have you cultivated that relationship? We need to be our focused on discipleship. I want all that God has for me. And I've been content with what C.S. Lewis would call playing with mud pies in the slums when a vacation at the beach is afforded us through the blood of Jesus Christ. I no longer want to play with mud pies in the slums. Uh, I want to grow. I want to become. I want to be serious about my discipleship. So moving forward, we're going to give you tools to take you from wherever you are to where you're supposed to be growing into. I don't care if you're Dwayne Pobel and you're walking on water, okay? There's more for him. Dwayne, I know you're home watching right now. Yes, I use you as an example, okay? We all know it. And I don't care if you're Dan Campbell who's just barely saved. There's more for Dan Campbell. <laughs> You know what I'm doing every time I mock Dan Campbell is making sure that nobody else was a civil for a row. <laughs> and revival. Revival. You know, I, I keep saying things like I'm just not content without the presence of God. I'm really starting to mean it. I'm really starting to mean it. If I can say it this way, there have been far too many Sundays I drive out of this place content because... I thought I preached good. I got some good laughs. I got, I got some compliments. Or, or attendance was decent today. So I drive away going, it was a good Sunday. It was a good Sunday. If the presence of God is flowing in this room, that's a good Sunday. Everything else is a waste of time. Everything else is a waste of time. I don't care if I get up here and dancing monkey you into, oh, it's just awesome. It's a waste of time if God's not here. Revive us, Lord. Revive us. We need the presence of God in this season. If we have nothing to give a hurt and scared world, other than my church is fun, we got light shows, the music is good, then what do we got to give them? We need to be people of the presence of God. The presence of God. The nearness of God. I want to come into this house and throw my arms over the band and say, Come on, Jesus. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Pass amongst us. God, walk up and down these aisles. Be with your people. Speak 
And every single one of us has that God-given barometer to know if it's happening or not. And what I'm saying is, my barometer is often telling me it's not happening anywhere near what it should. Revive us! Oh, still on? This is what I get for being leashed. The preach is good attached to wires. Revive us, O oh God. Revive us, O oh God. Revive us, Jesus. And so I'm going to close with this because uh, something's become very, very clear to me about asking for revival. As a matter of fact, I watched a really hard-hitting video that, that a friend of mine sent me just this week uh, about revival and, and the lady in this, in this video said, uh, you know, I keep hearing about revival. Like, you, like, especially in this season, I think a lot of pastors and a lot of spiritual leaders are talking about revival. And I think that a lot that's really God-given. I think that he's stirring in his body collectively a real hunger for the nearness of God. And I love it. And I say, yes, Lord, more and more and more and more and more. Give us more. Stir our hunger. It's the hunger, the invitation that invites the Spirit of God in. But the woman in this video said this. You know what step number one is? Repentance. So what I'm going to do is what I was trained in Bible college not to do. And that's end on a heavy note. The band can come back up here. We're going to bring it too close. I asked God this week in preparing this message. I said, God, I think that we're not serious enough about repentance. And what I don't want to do is ask you for the deep and the powerful things before I get things lined up correctly. Okay, because it's almost, and this might be a silly analogy, but it's almost like if I, I, I really try to woo my wife and we have a romantic day and I'm just treating her like an angel and I just expect her to, to respond to me in a way that's, that's loving. And, but if I haven't cultivated that relationship over time, if I've been neglectful of her and maybe emotionally abusive to her and I just treat her good on one day, you think that that's going to really awaken the romantic heart, the deep parts of my wife or her husband? Same thing holds true for our relationship with the Lord. If we just say, God, give us more, we want, we want the tingles. We want the good stuff. We want the power. But we're asking him to come into a filthy environment. <clears throat> you think he's going to respond? Maybe, just maybe that's why we're not getting the revival we're asking for. Yet. Maybe, just maybe. So in preparing this sermon, I asked God, I said, God, I want, I want to write something out that the Holy Spirit would need to hear from us to ask for forgiveness. Are, are we under the judgment of God? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that the coronavirus is judgment. I, I, I don't know. Um, matter of fact, I don't really think that it is. But I do think that's something that God has allowed. And I do think it's something that has changed society and changed the way our day-to-day -day lives look. And it's pointing us at the foundational, functional things of God. And it's pointing me to the fact that if you want the presence of God, if you want the lasting power to change and to be an agent of change, if you want to hold in your hands the power that is promised us, the miraculous that is promised us, the sixth distinctive of Mount View Christian Assembly, the supernatural encounters that are promised to us, you need to get serious about the condition of your house. You, anybody can experience God. And I walked into certain environments when I was backslidden beyond belief and I would experience God if God was there. But to house the presence of God, We've got to be a clean house. We've got to be a house that's serious about repentance. And we're oftentimes not. So here's what I wrote out, and I'm just going to read it to you. It will take a few minutes. And I want you to, if you agree, agree with me as I read this. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm not trying to twist your arm. I'm certainly not, certainly not trying to have some recitation exercise right here, right now. But I will tell you this much. I do believe that the Holy Spirit was flowing through me as I wrote this. 
So join me in your heart. We repent. We repent that we have far too long been something like idolaters. We have, through our words and our actions, elevated carnal and temporal things to the place of holy and sacred things. Only you are holy and sacred. We repent for our nation. We have brazenly disregarded you and your ways. We have demanded that you conform to our desires and our structures. We have justified wickedness beyond description, and we have called these justifications correct in the light of a broken modern perspective, calling it enlightened. We repent for you, church. We repent for your church. We rarely describe ourselves as or work toward being a bride without spot or wrinkle. And we have abused the authority of your word to beat people over the head with a perverted form of holiness and have neglected giving this world truth seasoned well with love. Like you showed us how to do, Jesus. We have worshipped programs and personalities when we should have always and only worshipped you. We repent for our homes. We have abused your grace and allowed our homes to become infected with practices, words, and relationships that grieve you. We have no longer looked at our homes through the lens of what will please you. And what will make the dove of the Holy Spirit welcome to live amongst us? And lastly, we repent for ourselves. Individually. Me. We have not lived in correct alignment with the life that the blood has purchased for us. Namely, a life defined by burning for you. I haven't burned for you when I'm supposed to. And I want to now. I want to. We have lived for ourselves, our comforts, our progress, and our provision, instead of relying on you for all of those things, and trusting that when you don't grant them to us, you are teaching us and building us into something we need to be. We repent. Now we humbly ask you to show your glory and your mercy in healing our nation, reviving our nation, heal our nation, revive our nation, heal our nation, revive our nation. Show us your glory and your mercy in healing and reviving our churches, healing of our homes, and healing of our individual lives. Huh. We welcome your revival, O oh God. Stand with me. Stand with me. At home, you just raise your hands. We welcome your revival, Holy Spirit. We will not waste this season. We will not waste what you have done. We will not waste what you're trying to get our attention with. And if I'm right, I think the first step in becoming what we're supposed to be is repentance. We need to build on a solid foundation now. We need to move forward having been rooted in correct alignment. We repent, now revive. We repent, now revive. We repent, now revive. Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. We're going to end with a few songs. At home, I would encourage you, we're going to stop the feed. Just spend a minute or two with the Holy Spirit. Spend a minute or two asking Him what your next steps are. Spend a minute or two surrendering, maybe repenting. Oh, it feels so good to come clean. It feels so good to say, you know what, I'm finally going to acknowledge that I'm broken. Because now I can be fixed. 
here in this auditorium. I'm going to ask that you, right where you are, if you want to come forward, you can come forward. Repent and ask for revival. It is time to get serious. Let's get serious. God bless you.